Hello there. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good morning. Depending on where you are. Very very warm welcome to today's discussion to the ETCEO dialogues presented by SAP. Thank you all very very much. Today we have with us top leaders from the Indian IT ITES space, and today we'll be talking about reimagining growth and operating models in the new normal. Uh, my name is Alokesh Bhattacharya. I'm senior editor at the Economic Times. Today, we are hoping that uh, the discussion will give us very sharp insights into the both the during COVID and after COVID scenarios. Suchetna, over to you. Hi. Hello, everyone. Once again, I'm Suchetna Ray. I'm senior assistant editor with the Economic Times. And I take this opportunity to welcome all of you to today's discussion with the hope and uh, I'm certain that it will give us sharp insights into the during COVID and the post COVID scenario. Um, this is Alokesh Das, as we call him fondly, Alokesh Das' favorite line these days. There are three phases of life, before COVID, during COVID, and after COVID. So from this discussion, we're looking at getting sharp insights about your experiences during COVID and post COVID. And we have a very powerful panel today. And a quick round of introductions. Uh, I take this opportunity again to welcome C.P. Gurnani, MD and CEO of Tech Mahindra, Devashish Chatterjee, MD and CEO of Mindtree, Tiger Tyagarajan, CEO of Genpact, Dheeraj Rajaram, founder and CEO of Mu Sigma. We also have with us Munish Dada, the co-founder, director and CTO of Icertis. We have Sumit Saragi, MD and senior partner of BCG. Sindhu Gangadharan, who's the SVP and managing director of SAP Labs India. And we have Sudhan Atrajan, director of BCCL. A big thanks to all the panelists for joining this debate today. Welcome one and all. And we also welcome all the people who have joined us to listen into this debate. Thank you all for taking time out today. You know, as this uh, pandemic ravages the world, you know, it's, uh, there's no sign of it stopping, right? It seems to be only getting worse and worse. Experts have predicted that the Indian IT sector will probably hit a decade low in terms of growth. And the impact may be worse than that of the 2008 uh, financial crisis. Uh, that is really ominous, you know, for a sector that has grown exponentially in two decades. You know, if you look at 1998, the revenues were just a trifling $4.8 billion. And today it is $190 billion. The industry today employs 4.36 million people. And it has played a very big role in India transforming itself into a services-led economy, right? And in today's situation, you know, the need for technology solutions during the pandemic has skyrocketed which should augur well for IT companies. Yet, you know, yesterday's results of uh, TCS, it indicates that things won't necessarily be very smooth going forward. Yeah, but Alokesh, also you have to remember uh, the TCS said that COVID impact has bottomed out. And perhaps that has also led uh, doomsayers to tone down their predictions, the decadal uh, uh, low growth and all of the, those predictions have we've seen being toned down over the last two uh, months specifically. The fact is there are too many variables perhaps that are at play today. The pandemic has created an unprecedented business continuity planning nightmare. Work from home is accompanied by cybersecurity concerns. Deals might not materialize from clients whose businesses are in trouble. And uh, the IT industry needs to look inwards at its own efforts at digital transform transformation. And to get a deeper understanding of the short-term challenges and what the medium-term and long-term goals for the IT sector, we will spend the next five minutes listening to insights from Sumit Saraugi of BCG. Over to you, Sumit. Thank you, uh, Sujetna. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sumit Saraugi. I'm a senior partner with BCG, um, and I lead um, our IT services practice. Um, I think, uh, thank you for the opportunity to introduce the topic uh, in the superhero panel, as Sudha was saying. Um, I think, you know, as we look towards the future, um, it, is, it is important to consider the long-term operating model for the industry. Um, and I think we were all forced into remote working by necessity. And if you look today, you know, more than 90% of the four and a half million people that, that Alokesh referred to are actually working from home. Uh, but the real question in the long term is how do we work, uh, move to a model where we do remote working by choice, uh, both for the organizations and for the employees. I believe that the future of remote will not be fully remote uh, will, or will neither be fully co-located. It will likely be a hybrid remote model, uh, you know, where people will either come to offices on, on alternate weeks or will come 
to offices for select collaboration days or will come to office once a month to meet with each other, um, et cetera, et cetera. And the best fit models uh, will have to be worked out. And I'm sure most of the, the panelists are already working them out for each of their different teams, for each of their different accounts. Uh, we in BCG actually did a, a survey for a lot of the remote workers um, you know, in the industry. Uh, and some very interesting findings came out uh, as, we, as we looked at that and we also spoke to many of the leaders. Um, I think from an opportunity perspective, uh, you know, there was a, a defined increase in productivity or employee productivity that was actually pointed out by the employees themselves. Uh, there are, of course, obviously a lot of potential of savings uh, or cost reductions that, uh, that organizations can have uh, from the reduction in their fixed costs. Um, remote working also opens up new supply models uh, for the industry. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, as somebody else was also saying, we need to find the sustainable model, uh, you know, going forward for remote working. Uh, you know, some of the challenges in front of us as an industry, uh, first around engagement and effectiveness. Uh, how do we have leaders that foster comparable coaching or productivity tracking uh, and performance management uh, for our people? Uh, and I know Tiger was talking about, you know, uh, about this a little while earlier, uh, but I think we need to train our leaders to be more output or outcome focused, uh, as opposed to more input focused or a number of hours on the job focused. Second, how do we approach recruiting uh, and onboarding of people? Uh, how do we have uh, routines and tools uh, for remote working that can be scaled up? Uh, how can we have continuous talent development? Uh, you know, one of the ideas being floated was actually Uberization of the gig economy workers. You know, can the industry move towards that? Uh, and lastly, uh, it is also about regulations and regulatory changes that are required, which will essentially need uh, the industry participants or organizations, NASCOM and the government to really work together uh, in order to to make sure that, that uh, remote working over a long-term basis is, is possible. Uh, I want to introduce the other topic as well uh, that we're going to talk about. Uh, and I think very often we as leaders are asked about, hey, what do you think is the growth potential? Uh, and I think Suchetna and Alokesh were referring to that in their opening statement as well. Um, you know, I guess, you know, we, you know, we were also curious about it as we spoke to different people in May and June, we actually went out to about 700 odd buyers of IT and IT services uh, to ask them about what would be COVID-19's impact uh, on the IT stack. And I think based on that and some of uh, my own thinkings, uh, you know, I wanted to introduce five key themes uh, that may be important as we reimagine growth in this, uh, in this industry. Uh, first, uh, offerings, what do we offer to our customers uh, is being refined and repackaged to be more in sync with the challenges that our clients are facing in, in times of COVID. Uh, firms are repivoting across geographies or sectors. Uh, more than half of the IT buyers expect, uh, you know, services like cloud, security, innovation, automation to be key priorities for next 12 months. This crisis has established new priorities in our customers, uh, and we as an industry uh, need to react to that and, and reimagine ourselves for that. Second, uh, as the COVID crisis hit, uh, there was a lot of concern uh, for how will selling happen? How will we be able to sell and engage with our clients? Sellers were concerned with closing sales virtually, uh, it was taking a long time. Uh, time and material businesses were becoming more, more vulnerable. Uh, but over the last two or three months, we have found that the industry is now, uh, you know, sort of more and more comfortable with virtual selling. Buyers are also adapting to uh, webinars. There have been multiple changes that, have, that the industry has done in terms of playbooks for virtual selling, um, you know, engagement models, and even changes in commercial model. 
uh, to make sure that the buyers are comfortable. Third, um, and, and this has been an evergreen theme and we can't lose sight of this, uh, there is a relentless focus or has to be a relentless focus on retaining the existing clients through cross-sell, upsell, uh, even changes in commercial model for the existing clients. Uh, fourth, and this is a favorite topic uh, you know, for many conversations, uh, is the fact that uh, is digital and platform or solution-driven sales going to increase in, in the market? We are actually already seeing some of that in, in May and June. Uh, and more than 60% of the leaders actually anticipate an increased investment in digital transformation. But, but here, is the, here, here is the interesting fact. Uh, instead of just revenue acceleration, uh, the buyers of this industry want digital uh, investments to go both in uh, cost reduction initiatives for them as well as revenue acceleration initiatives. Uh, and lastly, um, you know, downturns are always good for uh, acquisitions. Um, and we've studied downturns in the past as well. Acquisitions made during downturns tend to have a higher return. Obviously, the valuations are suppressed. Uh, but I think the industry needs to and is already looking at this as an opportunity to do some M&As or acquisitions to plug some holes in their offerings. Uh, we spoke to investors, about 70% of them actually plan to explore this, this crisis as an opportunity to, to acquire other companies. Uh, there are also some you know, last point on this is there are some non-traditional growth vectors that have also opened up as a result of the COVID crisis. Uh, and a GCC or a captive carve out being one of them. Uh, and I'm very sure that companies in, in the sector uh, are already thinking about it proactively, uh, you know, to, to see how they can take advantage of this. Uh, with that, uh, back to you, uh, Allocation and Suchetna. Right. So thank you, Sumit. In fact, uh, very, very insightful as we always expect from BCG and your five themes, you know, for reimagining growth is very, very interesting and very succinct. And I'm sure they will be of great use, you know, the, to the participants, not just the panelists, but even those who are listening in today. So let us start the panel discussion now. You know, uh, we come to basically we have three or four core talking points today. And uh, the first talking point really, you know, given that today's subject is on growth and operating models. So let us start with the operating models first, and then we'll go to the growth part of the debate. So uh, if you look at operating models, really, we, you know, we look at two aspects. One is that uh, what happened, uh, you know, uh, during COVID, what remote working during COVID, how did you, what are the learnings from there? And then what are the opening up strategies? Because the economy is now gradually being opened up all over. Uh, so, for example, I mean, we all know that about 90% of the IT workforce, you know, began operating from home since the lockdown began. And broadly, we know what the challenges were and what the workarounds were, uh, have been and how companies have uh, addressed it. But uh, if we look at the situation today, so I'd like to know from the panelists, what is the situation now? You know, have you successfully addressed both the infra, the security, as well as the people and motivational aspects? Is your business engine moving smoothly again? And what have you done to you know, make it work? So I'll start with uh, Devashish. Uh, Devashish is, okay, yeah, he's there. So Devashish, maybe you can start off this debate, you know, uh, about these questions on the, how the situation is, how do you see it now? And have you also seen the role of technology changing because of the pandemic? Thank you, uh, Alokesh. So I would say, you know, if you look at, <clears throat> I think before we started, we were talking about the, the pandemic and the impacts. And I was kind of feeling that there are a lot of good things which have happened because of the pandemic. In fact, a lot of things which we probably could have done earlier, but we are forced to change our behaviors, which, uh, and I think Tiger mentioned this, I think some of these behaviors may be continuing. It may, may not uh, change as we go forward. So I would say, you know, if I look at uh, a few things, if I just try to look at what are the challenges and what are the opportunities and what are the added responsibilities during the uh, remote working and let me just focus on that for the time being uh, first and foremost we need to understand that the whole definition of bcp has changed the definition of bcp was business continuity of your essential services which was uh, you know when you had the floods in chennai we basically focused on what uh, and how many people need to continue to work and how many 
uh, for how many days. But I think that entire definition of BCP has completely changed now. And nobody imagined that BCP could be for 100% of the people, for 100% of the workforce, and for a number of days, which is infinite. It's, uh, we still don't know when this is going to get over. So we need to acknowledge the fact that BCP itself has undergone a change in terms of its uh, definition. And uh, of course, there has been tremendous support from the government, from NASCOM, NASCOM rallied behind all of us, all the IT companies, and uh, we kind of got the uh, authorities to work towards uh, work from home. I think most of the companies uh, managed to get back to work from home. Yeah, there were challenges in some situations, but overall, I think productivity loss has not been there. I think bulk of the people that I have spoken with, they are very happy with the overall productivity. So. The challenges that we have come across, if you ask me the, the, the only challenge which I worry about, and this is something which I've heard from my uh, employees is uh, uh, we keep talking about work-life balance, but it is almost like life-work balance now. I mean, people are, are actually, some people are dying to get back to work because they are actually, uh, you know, and we have been talking about, it's not a good term, mental healthness and all those things, but it is really a problem because some people are dying to get back to work. Now, in terms of opportunities, I would say, as I said, there are a lot of things which we never wanted to do before. We are managing our businesses without, with 0% travel. So now I think I heard Tiger said, and which I completely agree to, and my travel will substantially go down. So I'll have significant uh, you know, time to myself, so we'll, which will also be saving a lot of uh, time. And uh, if you ask me the, the best learning I have got in terms of opportunity now, is uh, we used to talk about on-site, offshore, all these things, but we coined a term which is uh, no-shore. And uh, just look at the way we are on this call. It doesn't matter where you are. So it's like a no-shore agile model, which is evolving right now. And the best part of it is that it is not only evolving, the clients who were never agreeable to this, they have agreed to that. And you know, some of the agile work that we are doing, and when we talk about no-shore, it is just not the the, the teams that we are working on within my organization, even the client organization is also part of that team. And I'm sure all of you are experiencing that. So I think that's a fantastic opportunity. And uh, uh, you, you know, the other interesting thing that has happened, which I never thought would even happen before, and this is again something which we are forced to do, is uh, you know, there are a few deals that we had signed, again, just to be a little specific with respect to my organization. And I was not sure whether I can execute those deals because every deal, involve the transition and we have successfully done remote transition which i don't think we even imagine that clients will be, will be also agreeing to do a remote transition end to end and so these are the opportunities that uh, exist today but i think there is a big responsibility that we all have to acknowledge is as we talk about all these things i think these are all good things we have been resilient there are great opportunities ahead of us there are new new delivery models operating models which will emerge but my biggest issue that I am facing with today is the cyber. Because this is one area where I, see, I think that uh, we can say that we have been doing investments, but that is not good enough. Because right now, if you ask me, every organization is probably at, on its edge. And we do not know how cyber can be impacting uh, any one of us. And I think the, the only thing I would say is when it comes to cyber and data protection, uh, this is also something which is a, you know, the responsibility which the entire industry has to also take. I mean, when we talk about our workforce, when we talk about getting them uh, future ready, I think they also need to take some, act, you know, accept some responsibility because when something goes wrong in cyber, it is not one company which gets impacted. It's the entire industry that gets impacted. I think that's one thing which I feel is requires stricter governance. And, uh, you know, as we talk about cyber, we may have to look at, uh, you know, how do you modernize your workforce? How do you make your, yeah. India, you know, like for example, working from home, there are so many benefits. But one thing is that it has kind of exposed us to more security breaches, which we have to accept and we have to kind of be aware of. So maybe I'll just pause over there and, you know, as we go along, I can talk more. But I think there's been a lot of opportunities which have opened up in my view during COVID. Challenges have been overcome, but I think there are added responsibilities also that we need to take as an, as a, as an industry. Uh, Devashish, uh, thanks for those inputs. You spoke about responsibilities, opportunities, and challenges. So before I take that question to Tiger, I'd ask uh, my uh, colleague Nidhi to just run. Uh, we've curated a few short polls. So I'd ask, I'll request her to run the first poll. Take a look at it. All the audience who are joining us, we have over 400 uh, people attending it. All of you can take the poll. And uh, we'll shortly announce the results as well. Oh, wow, the results are there. 
So the question is, are you satisfied with your company's strategy to continue business during the lockdown? Are you satisfied with the strategy? Well, um, 54% are actually very satisfied and uh, 39, 38 to 39% say that they're satisfied, but there could be room for improvement. We're ending the first poll here. We have uh, two, uh, a few more lined up. And I take this question to uh, Tiger. Uh, taking off from where Devashish was talking about, give us a perspective of, a, of the BPO industry as you moved your entire, uh, you moved a large section of your workforce to remote working. What were the, what are the cyber security and infrastructure issues that you're dealing with? And also, we are, we are completely convinced that the productivity has increased. But how are you keeping your employees motivated? The work-life balance, as Devashish was talking about. Thanks for um, having me on the panel and. Uh... I'm going to take off from where Sumit and Devashish left off, which is uh, not dwell too much on uh, the challenges that they described, because those challenges basically were the same, irrespective of the nature of your business, whether it was a business that is focused on technology services or business process services or analytical services. I don't think there's that much of a difference between one and the other. Um, the, the significant challenge and accountability and responsibility that we face is exactly the one that she called out, which is the whole world, not just us, by the way, our clients and their workforce is, I think the best way to describe it is, is the way one of our board members described it. There's a 10,000 times increase in the surface area on which a cyber attack can happen for any company like ours. Uh, we have a hundred thousand people. We've had an increase of 10,000 times. And when you think about it that way, you realize the nature of the challenge that we are facing, our clients are facing. And I would say, I don't think we can ever get to a position of saying we've solved it. Because the reality is in cyber, you never solve anything because the day you solve it, you know, the attackers have gone one step ahead. So then you've got to solve that one. So it's a continuous progress on solving the challenge of being exposed. And that's where a little bit, Sumit, I'm going to differ from one of your statements. I by the way, agree with everything you laid out as the framework of the opportunity for the industry. I would uh, pretty significantly disagree with one statement. And I think we as an industry need to be careful about this. I don't think we should approach work from home as an opportunity for us and for our clients to save cost. Uh, our view is that it is, it is likely that in the short term, costs actually go up. Because when you talk about real estate and fixed costs as savings, that is not a sh short term implementation. That's a longer term implementation. Number two, let's talk about the medium and long term. Forget the short term. I think at best costs will be equal. Uh, and I think I would prefer that the industry take that position. I'll tell you why. Uh, I think it's easy to expect real estate to go down and et cetera, et cetera. The reality is if we don't invest that savings, potential savings in better security, in better life work balance, in better productivity tools, which I think uh, before the conversation Dheeraj uh, on the panel pointed out that look, productivity is also a function of what are you asked to do? I think we should keep that in mind. So what new things can we bring to our, to our employee base? And that would require investments. How do you drive innovation? Uh, how do you get groups of hundreds of people to continuously innovate? Uh, without having to stand around a water cooler. How do you create a water cooler environment uh, in a daily environment in an office without actually being in the office? I think all of those require significant investment. I think the other thing that we must understand, at least in our industry, our portion of the industry, um, which is the business process side, that actually significantly works 24 by seven in many cases, is that the infrastructure that we're talking about not only real estate, but also IT infrastructure used to be used by more than one person. Uh, eight hours by one person and eight hours by another person and eight hours by a third person. When you do work from home, every person has their own infrastructure. So I would, I would expect the industry to approach this as not a cost benefit for the customer because that I think is minimizing the opportunity. The real opportunity here is all of a sudden the aperture of talent that you can access is everyone in the world, anywhere in the world, in any city in India, in any city in Romania, in any city in Philippines. Number two, you can access talent that finally says, ah, I can do work without having to come to office. 
I mean, how many of us know people in our, in our personal lives, in our families, in our friends, who actually wish, and you wish they could actually work because you know they are cleverer than you, but they are not willing to sacrifice three hours a day to commute. They would prefer to work. Number two, they would prefer to work four hours in the afternoon and one hour in the morning and then two hours after you know, dinner. It's much easier to do that if you're actually sitting at home while you're running your life and then carving out those time slots. Uh, I think those are the opportunities that we can, that we can get into. Think about it, what it does to employability at leadership levels of women talent. Think about what it does to employability of racially diverse people in an economy like the US where racial diversity is such a challenge. So, um, and of course there is, there is a whole avenue of productivity to be unlocked, innovation to be unlocked when you can bring 50 people into a room conversation and they sit in 10 different countries. The ability to do that is so much easier now than if you bring 20 people in a room in New York or in Bangalore and the other 20 people join on calls. The reality is it's actually one meeting which is happening in the room. The other 20 people are actually kind of left out. Now it's democratization. Everyone is equal. So I think the world is gonna go through a significant discovery on all of this. There's a real opportunity. Uh, we've been forced to unlock it. I think Sumit is right. Constraints have been put in place. We and the clients have been forced to unlock it. And that applies to significant business model changes of our clients. I think there are five trends that we see that our clients are going to go through. Uh, offline to online, big change. Doesn't matter which industry. Uh, move to the cloud. It was a change. It's an exponential curve now. Uh, Real-time analytics on the fly. Analytics was always important. Insights were always important. But I want it now and I want it real-time. And I want a new model to be developed today. The old model is gone. That's an expectation more and more. Virtualization forever. Work from anywhere, anytime. Uh, by the way, the virtualization from ever is a combination of cloud and real-time analytics and online. So it's all intermingled with each other. And the last thing I'll say is when you want all of these, it better be with great experience. So experience becomes incredibly important. Uh, both user experience as well as employee experience. So we think those are the trends that our clients are gonna go through. And that's the opportunity for our industry to latch on to those trends, drive those trends for our clients, allow our clients to access those trends. I'll look into your own. Tiger, in fact, they were, you know, you, you spread it out really well. It's a lot of insight in that. And uh, in terms of the water cooler conversation, you know, that, is, that, is, that is really one of the key aspects, right? That how do you unlock innovation and innovative thoughts when you don't have these informal conversations between teams? How do you get 50 people, you know, even if you're getting them from different countries, like you said, you know, if you get 50 people in a virtual room, do, can they really be as friendly as they would if they were to meet physically? You know, how the people will have their cameras switched off and it's a really dif difficult situation to get them to interact in a very interesting way. One of the things that I had heard was that one company uh, had the one team from a company. What they did was they would keep their Microsoft Teams or whatever they were using, Zoom, whatever they were using, they would keep it on through the day. Through the work day, you keep it on. And, you know, you're, so you're actually hearing the conversations of other people and you cannot mute your mic. You do your work, you, you, even if you're talking to your kid or something, so you're in a conversational kind of uh, mode, you, you know, but of course, what that does to your bandwidth, you know, to your bandwidth and your <laughs> broadband is a, different, is a different thing. I'll come to CP, uh, CP Gurnani, uh, Tech Mahindra, CP, you know, you've been a massive leader in this industry and you, I don't, definitely you have not seen such a business continuity scenario before, you know, despite your experience. So it would be good to hear from you, you know, from a global delivery perspective, uh, what, what, how did you overcome the challenges uh, that were there and what are the opportunities that you see ahead? Thank you, Alokesh. Uh, it's good to at least come to this forum and say hi to some of the old friends like Tiger, DC and uh, Hirat. So, so guys, I mean, uh, uh, many of you have spoken regarding the world during COVID and post-COVID. To me, I'm trying to find the common chord between the current conversation. The common chord is how long is this crisis going to last? Many of us have debated whether this is the most serious crisis that the world has faced in, the, in our living times 
I don't think now there is any doubt just because of the serious, the sheer time and the intensity, the way the way it is tracking all over the world. The second part, I mean, so clearly now people have started talking September, October. We all know there has been a gradual unlockdown. At the same time, you started hearing a shorter lockdown also. So clearly this, uh, you know, uh, the Ludo game or uh, the game that we used to play, Snakes and Ladders, is here to stay. And the snake is really powerful at the moment. Uh, to me, I also, when I look at the global delivery model, I start looking at in this current environment, starting to view global delivery model as a musical instrument. Uh, when you start playing a musical instrument, we all know you need to practice. And once you are in tune with the music, in tune with the instrument, you do create uh, something memorable. I think it is an opportunity for the technology industry. The opportunity for technology industry to redefine completely what is known as work and culture. Uh, the way it is shaping up today is, uh, Sumit says hybrid. To me, I would like to believe like Tiger does that real estate is here to stay. I mean, I would love to go to office at least a few days in a week. Maybe, uh, you know, uh, some people may call it old fashioned, but I think I get my energy out of going out of office. I mean, I do believe that uh, uh, there is a, you know, a second element to work and customer, which is the social element, which is the cultural element. And I love those interactions. I love you know, walking around and getting a feel and being able to interact with people. And it's not that I always get that Edison moments and I get innovative ideas, but there is so much I get from listening. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'll just narrate a simple story. One week ago, I meet a young mother in my Pune office and I ask her what brings you to office. She said, I just wanted to get out. I said, why? I thought you were, you girls were the ones who used to always say, allow us to work from home. I mean, this is again, Tiger trying to get, uh, you know, uh, that woman feel privileged about it. Now, he said, when I'm home, my nine-year-old expects mom is home only for me. She said, I, I, I do need space. He said, when I'm home, my husband thinks, hey, honey, why don't you make that curry? You always make that curry. I mean, I don't make curry on a Wednesday. You know, my mother-in-law, who used to help me out, now thinks she has to give me space. So she leaves the whole kitchen. Now she was watching her favorite serials, and I am the one who is balancing kitchen, husband, and my nine-year-old. Thank you very much. I want to come to office. So my point here is not about technology harmony. My point here is not about global delivery centers. My point here is not only about culture, it is also about we. When we come to office, we actually, in a lot of ways, uh, create that balance, uh, which is you know, the wrong way to put it, but that is actually the life work balance. And uh, my personal opinion is that yes, uh, work from home is here to stay and it has been proven now. You know, what DC said, uh, you know, what is on-site, what is off-site, what is no-sure, $181 billion organized, uh, uh, the industry has recognized that uh, best is that you work wherever you are. And I love the idea of visualizing DC in his beach shots uh, working from, uh, uh, you know, the beach in Goa, wherever he is. So, and you can only see the shirt. Yeah. You can't see the shirt. <laughs>
no, no, DC, DC uses augmented intelligence and he will show you a workplace where he has got 1,000 people behind him. <laughs> right, sir? So in, as a go-up, that will be quite a sight. <laughs> yeah. So my, my point is very simple. Uh, I think uh, many of us will redefine the work culture. Many of us will define the technology stacks. Uh, what we consider cyber security as a threat, I consider cyber security as an opportunity. Uh, the reality is those five parameters that Tiger said about cloud to virtualization to customer experience, all of these are opportunities for the India uh, growth story. It is for us to weave it and be able to satisfy ourselves and the rest of the world that digital is here to stay. Uh, you know, mixed working is here to stay, whether we call it hybrid or whatever. The redefinition of culture, redefinition of infrastructure, and a redefinition of uh, how the industry will evolve is here to stay. For us, mm -hmm. uh, frankly, we have never had a better catalyst and a better opportunity. Uh, I'll take the question to Sindhu. Uh, but before that, CP, I must tell you, as you were speaking about women, workplace, most of my lady colleagues on uh, WhatsApp were cheering for you, really, that you understood their position so well. Uh, I'll take the question to Sindhu. Uh, how has a global software product giant like your company handled the situation in India and in your uh, home market? Uh, how are you uh, looking at this entire uh, situation? How does it look now from the time when the pandemic struck us and it induced lockdowns? Yeah, first of all, um, it's great to be on this very esteemed panel and uh, share my thoughts. Thanks for having me here. Um, and also, uh, CP, it's always great to see you and also hear you. You always bring in the, the kind of uh, balance between work and your personal experiences. Love hearing that. Uh, yes, so to your question, um, uh, Suchetna, I mean, um, from an SAP point of view, right? I think um, we started, um, I mean, you know that we, we operate out of um, several locations globally. And we had kind of the precedence of seeing China go into the into the lockdown before any 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 other country went into a lockdown. This was already uh, back in December, to be precise, where we were all like, okay, that's something that's happening there and may not impact us. However, I have to say, as the kind of um, um, the pandemic kind of um, took on its uh, fear side, it all, the the lockdown in China also gave us a little bit of time to kind of prepare ourselves also to go into lockdown in the other locations that we operate out of, right? Um, and, and given the fact that SAP, I mean, uh, we anyway have a work from home policy even prior to COVID. So this was uh, nothing new in the sense of uh, whether we have the right infrastructure in place or whether we have all the um, uh, kind of bandwidth availability, things like that. Even in India, where we have 13,000 of our employees present, we have a no desktop policy, right? So it's uh, pretty much 100% of our employees here uh, use laptops. And uh, we always had a work from home policy, but nobody knew that we were looking at it from these extended periods of time, right? Um, and what was also the case, just also reflecting back in that uh, first week of March, I think it was uh, where we kind of used that time before India went into a lockdown to also kind of simulate this uh, um, where we have uh, all our employees simultaneously getting onto the VPN and uh, connecting to the to the network and making sure that anybody who had challenges could um, be given the support as needed. And so this also helped us kind of prepare for it to kind of go into that uh, prolonged working from uh, home mode. However, what if, and um, I think a lot of points were made on productivity and all that. And I just want to reflect that this was also our experience uh, as we went into the mode of 100% uh, working from home, we also did a lot of productivity checks. In fact, um, almost every month we do a survey across our uh, product engineering function, which is 30,000 employees across the globe. And we saw that, in fact, productivity uh, significantly had uh, picked up, right? So across, even if you look at things like uh, product backlog management or even customer usage patterns, or even in how teams collaboratively work together. So Tiger was talking about that great equalizer earlier on. We actually saw that. But what we see as a concern and which is something that we absolutely as an industry also need to look into is 
these prolonged work from home modes, how are we going to sustain it, particularly also from a mental stress and kind of uh, uh, people having heightened levels of stress levels. And this came out also quite um, clearly in some of the uh, surveys that we did. And so we are also uh, putting in uh, place uh, employee assistance program. So just to quote this employee assistance program called Sahyo, where we are looking into not just uh, um, proactively talking about some of the tricky topics like mental health, depression, uh, also things like, uh, I think, um, a lot of, um, of our employees in India particularly also have have caregiving responsibilities, which adds to the challenges that they face, right? So on one hand, everybody is out there to kind of uh, make sure that it works. We get the ultimate customer satisfaction, productivity is going up. But on the other hand, the stress levels clearly is high. And, uh, and what we also are looking into is putting together policies in place that allow for people to very quickly use programs like Sahyog to come in there and uh, in a, in, a, in a very anonymous way, also discuss uh, challenges that they face uh, across a whole range of topics. And I think this is super important. And I think this is something we should not underestimate, uh, even if we go back to these hybrid work models. The other thing which I think is important, I mean, on a weekly basis, we, we hire people, right? And this continues. We went into a fully virtual onboarding mode. Um, so we onboard and also recruit people fully virtually. Uh, however, what you see is very quickly the, the culture aspect. I mean, as a company, we enjoy a culture where there is a flattened hierarchy. Uh, I mean, access even to the executive board is pretty straightforward. Uh, that is a culture that we enjoy in the organization. So th that culture uh, and imbibing that culture into the new hires and the people, that's also something that, uh, that we are looking into because this is something that you don't just... Uh, sit um, uh, alone in isolation in your homes and kind of imbibe that culture. That culture has to be experienced and felt, right? Um, so in that sense, yes, um, technology has played a very significant role in helping us navigate through these times. And uh, I think the opportunity aspect was also discussed in detail. But as, as a company, and um, we are also looking into how we can keep the employee morale very high and how we can also bring back uh, and imbibe that uh, the cultural aspect that we are so proud to enjoy as an as an organization also into the new hires into the organization. Thank you very much, uh, Sindhu. In fact, you raised some very very interesting points. You know, the, one of the thing about productivity, uh, most of the panel most of the panel agrees that productivity has increased. I know Dheeraj doesn't agree, and I, I'm going to come to him next, and maybe he can tell us about it a little bit about it. But uh, the problem that uh, I see, you know, from our perspective is that the, while everybody is working from home, there is no switch off time, you know, just like what CP was saying. When do you switch off? There is no fixed time because what happens in office is when I finish work and I'm going driving back home, that drive back home from office to home is the period of transition for me mentally from my mindset. I'm moving away from office and getting into home mode. By the time I reach home, office is out of my mind. But that space you know, that transition uh, does not exist when you're working at home and your work starts at unearthly kind of hours. You know, somebody might call you at 7 a.m., 8 a.m. to ask on something and then you go on till midnight. So that is where the stress and all are coming out. Uh, and in the long term, it might hit productivity while it is raising it now and it's just been three or four months. We really don't know what it's going to look like in a year or maybe, you know, uh, 15 months later. If this thing still continues till then and we hope that it will not. So uh, we'll come to Dheeraj and uh, Dheeraj, uh, you know, uh, and from an analytics perspective, I'd like to have your view. I mean, apart from the fact that uh, what did you do as a company, but, uh, you know, uh, is it easier for companies like yours where you provide very high tech analytics, you know, data analytics services uh, in terms of navigating not just the challenges of COVID, but also the market? Is it slightly easier for you compared to the regular IT services companies? And how did Absolutely. you handle it? No, absolutely. Uh, uh, it is easier. Actually, our business has actually increased in the last six months. Uh, uh, that was going to be my business. next question, but anyway, you've taken yeah. it all. No, I think it's very straightforward uh, because uh, our business is not directly proportional to consumption. Our business is directly proportional to uncertainty. Uh, the more the uncertainty, the more the questions and the more the need to ask questions um, so first, first thing I want to ask you, I mean, I, and the reason, um, and, and I do believe that lots and lots of good things have happened. Uh, and I am actually more positive 
um, you know, about uh, my optimism has only gone up. Um, but first thing first, I would ask, I would, I would want to say is that, um, you know, in the last three, four months, what we have experienced, one thing that has exposed this, the last four months has exposed to us is that we were capable of doing a lot more than we thought we were capable of, right? Which means that we are, we as a community are not asking the question, why not enough? That is clearly exposed at a leadership level. We are not asking the question, why not enough? We are asking the question, how? We are asking the question, what? We are asking the question, why? But we are not asking enough the question, why not? And that's why we are surprised about how much we were able to do. Okay. So that's the first piece of it. The second piece of it is that, uh, you know, this whole aspect of the virus and COVID and the shock that we have felt, uh, if you look at it, right, it has directionally not changed anything. It has just accelerated things, right? Accelerated irrelevance, right? The way I would look at it is that things that were going to become ter- irrelevant, uh, you know, uh, if you're a physics buff as per second law of thermodynamics, uh, you know, are becoming irrelevant even faster, right? So um, uh, we have just experienced time has jumped like a nice kangaroo five years. It has just jump, jumped up. If I am, uh, you know, if I am 45 years old right now, I need to think that I am 50 because five years has just passed in the last three months, right? So this experience of time jumping has happened. Um, time has become the criteria of the future. Okay, we were move, we were in this world of bigger is better. Now we are in this world of faster is better. What does that mean? We were in the world that was denominated by physical things and capital, and therefore economies of scale was the competing metric. Now we are in the world of non-physical things and time is the denominator. And when you put time in the denominator, it's economies of speed. So as you move from economies of scale to economies of speed, you are not making products and services like somebody said, I think Tiger said this before, you're making experiences and how you think of the, think of outcomes that you're delivering with a why not perspective uh, where the science of technology come together. The science of design and the art of technology must continuously come together to keep asking the question, why not? And if you are in the business of asking, why not? You are in the business of discovering ignorance. And unless, you know, so you just don't know what you don't know. And, uh, and my perspective around, uh, you know, uh, uh, why I challenge the norm of productivity is because I think we are not testing ourselves to the question of why not. And therefore, in this world, which is a little sluggish, we are probably not being challenged enough. And, uh, and therefore, as this world evolves to be to, to, to present the full challenges, uh, and I'm hoping and I, I and I'm super optimistic about this, we are going to we are going to create lots of interesting ways, um, you know, of asking this question, why not? If, if, if there's one thing which I would talk to my business friends right now, I ask us, so clearly we were not asking why not enough, right? And as an entrepreneur, as a founder, you know, uh, I, I am in the business of taking risks and therefore I encourage, you know, uh, all of us as a community to say, ask the question, why not more? Um, you know, uh, ask the question, work from wherever more. Uh, ask the question, uh, you know, uh, are you thinking about, uh, you know, uh, your, your differentiator as a business is going to be your responsiveness, right? Uh, how responsive you are to a world that's going to constantly keep changing because the entropy has constantly increased. Now, I, I you know, I was, I was listening to CP very carefully, um, you know, and, uh, and, and, and when he said that this is the biggest crisis that we have faced, uh, well, I can tell you one thing. It's kind of like Bollywood. You know, the next movie will be a bigger hit, right? So, uh, because crisis builds on itself, and there is a there is a there is a nature of complexity where it has to build. It is cumulative product. It is not a. It is a, so we will be facing the 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 rem- remnants of this crisis for a long time, and whatever next crisis is going to build on it. So when you see what's happening in America. As this COVID crisis was building up, 
you saw the racial crisis building up as this covid crisis so what you are facing is a not a racial crisis anymore it's a covid crisis plus a racial crisis and in india you are facing a covid crisis plus a china crisis and if you face then it will be a covid crisis plus a cyber crisis so so that, that's and by the way that's entropy that's just how complexity works so what that means is um you know uh, you need to uh, you know we all of us together have to kind of uh, because we are now front and center in the business of dealing with uncertainty and asking why not you have to be a producer of optionality you constantly have to be a producer of optionality are you a consumer of optionality or are you a producer of optionality people who are producers of optionality producers of innovation um, should constantly feel dissatisfied with uh, how much we are asking this question why not and therefore challenge ourselves uh, saying ye kafi nahi hai this is not enough and we have to uh, you know get to that place uh, which is uh, which will allow us uh, to 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 truly truly be uh, innovative for our customers which actually the, the 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 surface area of our customers like our surface area of our cyber has increased surface areas of our what we can touch as customers and how you can touch as our customers with what you can touch our customers has also increased so net you know which which means that you know it's it, it, the, the question our surface area for why not has increased so that's how i would put it thank you very much uh, dheeraj in fact you know your comments are as sharp as your software you know when you talk of data analytics and very very sharp insight thank you very much i'll come to monish but before that you know monish uh, i'd like to take uh, you to and the other panelists also to take a look at the second poll that we have lined up nithi can you roll it out please okay so we have about 500 people here and the question is who will benefit more from permanent work from home company will benefit more employees will benefit more nobody will benefit not sure i think there's one answer missing right both will benefit <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to keep that it's too neutral okay we'll have to give it a little time because there are almost there are about 200 people to go to vote we are waiting for them to come in a lot of people are not sure but one more than 130 people feel that the company will benefit company will benefit more than the employees yes interesting insight It's a trick question. So, okay, have we got everybody? No, your people are still voting. I can see the numbers climbing. About three fifty have voted already. Right, right, right. Everybody, hurry up. Fortunately, companies see? cannot vote, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's only a and the, and the pa- panelists cannot vote. This is all. It's all. You know, the, your employee's voice. it comes through in the best companies to work for kind of stories <laughs> yeah. okay i think we've got more or less the whole draft drift of it nidhi we can end the poll it's about 368 i don't think anybody else is uh, too very keen so it's a interesting split but obviously company will benefit more people tend to believe a little more monish maybe you know along with your uh, insights into uh, you know your part of the analytics piece and how it works for your company in this kind of pandemic situation you could also tell us a little bit about this permanent work from home thought and the fact that people actually believe that the company will benefit more than the employee yeah thank you and and thank you again for having me on the panel so uh, it, 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 you know for me having heard you know uh, the thoughts of everybody on the panel the rest of them i think it's a very interesting thing for us uh, you know we are substantially smaller we are an enterprise saas company so we don't have thousands of people we have 1200 so our problem was of course you know much more ringed uh, but we still had to deal with it and we moved from kind of being uh, you know a mix of work from home and work from office to completely 100% work from home in about 48 hours so our transition was very quick um, in software development especially enterprise software development people are used to working from home people are used to doing implementations uh remotely and so on so so that transition was fairly straightforward um it was interesting though to kind of give people a structure we came up with this rings of responsibility saying hey how do you deal with this situation how do you deal with it at home how do you deal with it in your family how do you deal it with it with the business and the customers and i think that helped 
our em employees quite a bit. Assertions were really, they got some structure out of this to work with. So one good thing I think we did overall was to make sure that we went in the crisis with the structure. I think the second thing was we were very influenced by this whole idea of Taleb. This is a black swan event and resilience is kind of, people are kind of thinking about how to be resilient, how to cope up with it. We went and said, why not be anti-fragile? Essentially make sure that we are actually leveraging this kind of a situation to think better. And I think that's where I uh, resonate with Dheeraj. He said, why not? You know, the question that you have to ask. And we said, you know, we initially, and you know, whenever the, something like this hits, I remember the 9-11 days I was in Boston uh, when the attacks on the World Trade Center happened. And that was a crisis which was fairly localized, though it kind of spread to the world, but it was fairly localized. But at that time also the first reaction was shock. The second reaction was concern. The third reaction was, okay, now how do I handle this? The fourth reaction was, okay, now how do I leverage this? Right. So having gone through and all of us have gone through these crises, I think coming to the mindset of, hey, how do I handle this better? How do I leverage this actually is, is extremely important. I think that's the lesson, um, you know, we learned from this crisis in terms of how to handle an enterprise SaaS company that way. Um, the second thing I wanted to say was, you know, if, if, I, if, if I look at what has happened in the last few months, I think. Tiger said this right at the beginning when we were having this discussion before we started, you have to kind of make sure that the other party is also willing to come with the change. So uh, as Dheeraj described, the entropy is increasing, but the entropy with Maxwell's law is essentially going to be increasing because everyone is moving away. But if you are the only one moving away, you have a problem, right? But this crisis actually made everyone come together in a way saying that, hey, work from home, remote execution, making sure that you're working from home, from your customer's perspective, even banking and insurance sectors who are traditionally saying, hey, you, know, you leave your cell phones out the door before you come into my offshore development center, all that has completely changed, right? And we, we think about cybersecurity, I think it's also boils down to how you become more anti-fragile. If you can manage a desktop from home, with the same level of security that you were managing from the office, which I'm, I bet every one of us is going to do because there's no choice. Uh, we are automatically becoming more anti-fragile, right? Because we are now level automatically, we're forcing ourselves to make sure that our levels are going up. Uh, the same thing that CP gave an example of, you know, you go home and say, uh, you know, why don't you make kadi for me? Now the conversation I'm sure will change to, hey, come on, I'll teach you how to make the kadi, you can do it yourself. Right now, that big transition is also a form of anti-fragility. I think it's also, you know, if I have to draw another metaphor, which I've always resonated with in the last four months, uh, if you've watched Jurassic Park, that's a line there, which is very potent, life finds a way. And in these kind of massive changes that happen across the world, life will find a way. We will find how to deal with our mental problems. We'll find how to deal with working from home, being less social, than we were before, finding out ways of becoming more social in some ways, because the world is becoming, you know, coming closer together. Uh, I think just like the social revolution, this distancing revolution is also, will also play out very well. And there is that opportunity there. And I think that is why I also kind of very, very strongly resonate with the fact that companies should not look at this as an opportunity to save money companies should look at this as an opportunity to create opportunity. I think that's so critical because that's how your mind share changes. That is how people, individuals as well, this applies not just to companies, but individuals. You know, you are in a situation, yesterday actually, it was very close to, uh, uh, you know, my heart story. We onboarded 55 fresh graduates from, you know, our campus hiring uh, and all 55 people joined, uh, students joined yesterday. I was talking to them and said, hey, how do, you, how do you feel? And they said, you know, when, when we heard this, we were very concerned. We didn't know if we would have a job. And I said, what did you do? How did you think about this? And, the, you know, we, I got like 20 different answers. And one person, one student actually said, you know, Monish, we actually, when I heard about this, I started thinking about what else I would, I could learn. What courses could I take? You know, could I go do machine learning? Could I do artificial intelligence. And I said, exactly. That's how you think about an opportunity that is created by adversity. 
And I think that is where, you know, we've also been thankful from a perspective of, you know, how we've reacted and how people have reacted to say that, hey, this is how you channel your energies into becoming more positive. Also, you know, business has been great for us, you know, digital transformation, uh, as, uh, uh, you know, as we heard uh, from Sumit as well, uh, digital transformation is big. So contract management has actually been the center of most people's most companies digital uh, transformation initiatives anyway. So business has been great, but even then you have to make sure that people don't get that angst, uh, that that worry in terms right. of how to deal with business. Right. I think uh, Su Sudha has something to say. Sudha, you wanted to, uh, you want to have just come in a bit? Yes, yes. I just wanted to uh, mention something. See, we, we spoke, yes, there is a pre-COVID era, there's a during COVID era, and there's a post-COVID era. So human beings, function in a specific way, in a particular way, when threatened, when forced to. But when there is a choice, we might function in a slightly different manner. So while during COVID, this is the manner in which we are performing, maybe it has brought out the best in us, maybe it has made us far more resilient, maybe it has you know, taught us a lot more humility and several other lessons. But post-COVID, when we are going to have a choice, how much of this is really going to carry on? And Dheera, you, you kept mentioning why not. Tell me how much of why not will happen again during post-COVID. There will be a hangover. It will certainly be, you know, the, uh, the decay will not be so soon. There will be a lag effect and uh, the baseline will go up slightly post it's not going to come back to where it was before. But I would like, you know, the IT industry really to dwell on post-COVID is not going to be what during COVID is going to be. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's a very, very uh, relevant point. Um, you know, I think I thought about this. And uh, because, uh, uh, you know, the elasticity, elasticity of the current situation uh, will be tested post-COVID and we will go back like a rubber band, right? But I think the, the way you should think about this is that um, if you look at the Pareto, which is 80-20, right? Um, and the, the nature of the last 10 years has been that 80-20 has become 85-15, has become 90-10, has become 95-5, has become 98-2. 2% of the world owns most of the wealth, yes. right? The reason for that is because they ask the question, why not more often? And they ask the question, risk, they do the risk taking more often. My perspective to you would be that, you know, this polarization, right? What's going to happen? I believe this is my, again, this is my world, world view. I could be wrong about this, but at least I have to put it out there, you know, and, and I'll go out on a limb and, and put it out there is that what will happen is that we will, many people will actually go back and the few people who don't go back will build the future, right? So think about this. We jump to two, you know, 2025 today. Many people will come back to 2021, right? Few people will start from 2025. And the difference between the guys who are in the future and the guys who are now will be larger. And that polarization will mean that the innovators will benefit a lot more. The, the benefit from why not has just increased because of this. But I think there's another aspect to this, right? Uh, the, the other aspect to this is... If, if, you, if you think about how this, uh, these crises generally evolve, obviously, you know, this is probably one of the biggest. Uh, but if you look at, you know, 9-11, if you look at the mortgage crisis, if you look at all of these crises that have happened, even the plague, um, you know, 150 years ago, uh, the, the, what happens is, you know, people react. There are four or five fundamental changes that, have ha that happen in society. And then the world kind of reorients itself like a magnetic field around those four or five fundamental changes. Right. And that's I think that's exactly what's going to happen here. You know, again, theory, of course, you, unless it happens, you never are sure whether it happens or not. But I think that's that's what, you know, four or five changes. One of them is work from home, you know, work them kind of be more careful, be more sensitive about distancing, you, you know, the business models, travel. I think these are four or five things that will fundamentally change how we work and live. I think if I can Yes, yes, please, uh, Devashish, go ahead. Just to extend on that, I mean, if I can just add, uh, while talking to one of my clients, I, I heard something very interesting. And uh, he said that uh, uh, this is not the end. 
I mean, there could be another pandemic which can happen. So I think people have already started thinking that uh, post COVID, don't assume that there cannot be another COVID like scenario. And to the point that Monish made, I, I have a view, and this is something which I'm observing right now. You know, clients have been talking about digital transformation. And when you talk about digital transformation, I think it is transformation led by digital, but we call it digital transformation. And we have been talking about cost takeout. We have been talking about reimagining our own business models or like customers' business models. I think one thing which I'm seeing right now, and I'm, I don't know whether you, all of the other panelists are seeing that in their business, is that clients are now seriously thinking about reimagining their business models. I mean, simply take the example of airline. They have to think of more contactless, for example. And uh, if you think of reimagining your business models, uh, it cannot happen unless you really leverage IT. So I think uh, from an IT industry standpoint, I feel that IT has become more central post-COVID or IT will become more central to the transformation uh, when it happens, when you're talking about reimagining your business models than ever before. So I think there's a great opportunity. And I'll add one last point, which is again sure. something which I'm seeing that clients are willing to have conversation these days. We have been talking about business outcomes. We have been talking about can we be measured on business outcomes rather than getting into pure TNM and all those things. I can see that some conversations have started now. It's not, it's easier said than done, but I think some conversations have started where clients are willing to, because the only way you can avoid this discussions about on-site, offshore and all these things is truly going towards a business outcome. I think we can, if we can drive that kind of conversation, that will be a tremendous value add for the industry as well. Right. Um, I think an interesting, uh, quote, uh, uh, interesting quote one of my clients told me is that crises are like washing machines and they will toss you and turn you, but you will end up looking brighter at the end of it. So hopefully that's the case from an innovation perspective. A little crumpled. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that could be fleshed out to have a nice uh, line, you know, <laughs> a nice uh, catch line. So we're getting questions from uh, the over 400 audience that we have. Questions from Chetan Mehra, from Su. This is Sudhir Singh. All questions pointing towards uh, new growth avenues. Um, and uh, see, from our perspective, what we see are three primary challenges to growth. First, the, pri uh, the pandemic has brought home the need to diversify risk. And, and here I speak about the over-dependence on the US and Europe as dominant markets and uh, select verticals for major chunk of top lines. Secondly, digital tech services now comprises 18 to 20% of Indian IT stock line and growing at 40% Plus, this opens up a new growth frontier, you know, along with associated challenges, of course. So thirdly, analysts say that the new order flow may remain slow in 2020. So let us examine all the three aspects and look at growth through spreading of risk, growth through digital and uh, growth through order pipeline. And I'll take this question to Tiger first. You know, you've come a long way from the Jekyll's days. Genpak's 2018 annual report says that you have 700 clients, yet the top 20 contribute to more than 40% of revenue. Now, uh, BPO is 83% of revenues, BFSI industry is 37, 37% of your revenues, and India is 55% plus of work delivered. So are you rethinking this mix for future growth? No, we love, uh, we love our current uh, uh, strategic direction that we took in 2013. And the reason I say that is because uh, if you take a look at three dimensions, let's start with industry verticals that we serve. For a variety of reasons, that has nothing to do with the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Because we weren't, we weren't <laughs> crystal ball gazers that said, hey, pandemic is coming. Um, <laughs> We chose a set of industry verticals that if you think about our current business today, and we obviously did a very quick evaluation, uh, they've stood the test of a pandemic attack better than some of the more harder hit industries. For a variety of different reasons, we haven't got a big business in travel, airlines, cruise lines, uh, upstream energy, nothing. Uh, we're very binary in our choices, by the way. When we make a choice, we go double, triple down on it, and then we ignore the other things completely. We have, as a company, we are very good. We have 100,000 people say, we'll do this. Uh, strategy is about a 10-page document. Nine and a half pages is a definition of what we will not do. The last half page is what we will do. And then we all stick to it, 100,000 people. And then every year, we revisit the topic of, should we do something else? But that's a revisit rather than a transactional, hey, should we do this today? Should we do this tomorrow? 
So industry verticals, we're thrilled about our choices. The second is uh, uh, the types of services that we are in, where we engage with our clients to drive value to them. We've always considered our services to be incredibly non-discretionary. I mean, our clients can't wake up in the morning and say, ah, I don't want this today or tomorrow. It's still true. The best test of that is what happens through the pandemic. Uh, we believe that we are going to be highly resilient through the pandemic, uh, through mm -hmm. a combination of the choice of industry verticals and the choice of services. Uh, and a lot of those services, irrespective of what the company is going through, our client is going through, in some respects, they need us even more. Uh, and the third is the geographic distribution of the work and where we perform that work, where we have the teams, et cetera. 10 years back, the concentration of that in India was dramatically higher than it is today. Uh, today, we deliver services from 23 countries. Uh, we have a distribution of work that spans from China to Philippines, to Malaysia, to India, to six different countries in Europe, to four countries in uh, Latin America, to US, Canada, uh, Australia, UK. I mean, these are places where our teams are located and sit in operating centers and deliver services, create solutions, work with our clients. And the pandemic has demonstrated the resiliency of having that distributed network. By the way, they function as one team, which is if I'm serving client X. I may be having a team that is distributed in nine locations. There's one leader who's responsible for those nine locations and the thousand people who sit in those nine locations as one virtual team. Therefore, for us, the virtualization of our services was not, oh my God, we got to do something new. It's something similar to what Manish said. We've been a virtual team forever. Uh, in 2011, when I took over as the CEO, I said, there is no headquarters that this company has, which by the way, we don't have a headquarters. We've said that publicly many times. My leadership team of 20 people are not in one city. They are in 11 different cities. Uh, we get together often virtually, uh, so that's nothing new. Uh, there's no such thing as let's get together in this office because we never did that. So for us, life hasn't changed actually. Now, has life changed in an operating center? Yes, it has. Now they work from home. But the ethos of the company hasn't changed. So, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a counterpoint to risk diversification. The danger in risk diversification being used as a reason to do many things takes away from what I think is core to strategy, which is focus. Pick two things and become the expert and become number one or number two in that. Now pick the two right things. So diversification is not about a peanut butter, let's do everything approach. Diversification is about, can you strategically make the right choices? And those choices may be only do two things, don't do 98 things. Thank you. In fact, that is a very strong. So it seems that your growth model remains intact despite the pandemic and you will continue the same strategy as before. Is that uh, the yeah, idea? So our, our strategy, I think someone else said it right. Our strategy hasn't changed. I think Dheeraj said this. Our strategy hasn't changed because our client's strategy hasn't changed. Right. It's accelerated what already was happening. Right. At the leadership level, some of them wish they could do it faster, but they did not. I think it's a great question to say, why the hell did they not? Because they were unwilling to break glass. Well, the world broke glass for them. <laughs> so now they're all thrilled. So now they are saying, instead of taking three years to do this, can we do it in four weeks? So by the way, the time element of this is not, can we do it 30% faster, 40% faster, 75% faster? No. It's instead of doing it in years, can we do it in weeks? Order of magnitude. So there is, I mean, there is no comparison. So there's an order of magnitude here and you start with a clean sheet of paper approach. Um, right. so, so, so for us, it is an acceleration of all the strategic pivots that we had, we had started pushing on, cloud, uh, real-time analytics, uh, going deeper into our client's business and understanding our client's business, having made the choices that we made. Uh, so all of those are just an experience. We just did a big acquisition in November of a company that's focused only on experience. All of those are just accelerated. And therefore, is our growth intact? So, so I want to refer a little bit to, I think, the way, um, uh, Sujitna, you launched the conversation, which is the industry is going to be challenged um, from a, 
decade long lower growth than the whole decade yeah. and that's what that's an analyst of the that's what the analysts are saying the way you said it felt like oh wow the industry is going to deal with a you know a lowest growth in a decade so uh, my 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 position on that is uh what is that growth relative to the growth of the world mm-hmm. and i think we are going to be very fortunate that the growth of this industry is going to be much better than the growth of the world mm-hmm. number 1 number 2 what is the growth of that industry in india versus mm-hmm. the growth of the other industries in india and it's going to be way better than that so if the world is going to shrink then why should we be sitting in an ivory tower and saying no 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 we cannot be lower growth of course we'll be lower growth but isn't it fabulous to be 5% growth when everyone else is minus 10% what a great position to be in isn't it great to be flat zero growth when there are companies who and industries are going to be minus 15% growth what a fabulous position to be in so i love the fact that we are in this in this industry i love the fact that we can say we're going to be flat growth pure that's how we fantastic that's really 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 sharp you know and you sound just like tiger right <laughs> great great <laughs> insight and a lot of conviction you know i'll come to sindhu because you know there's been a lot of uh, you know we we also suchetna also made the point about digital transformation of technology companies themselves right and uh, the reskilling and upskilling uh, you know need that has been there already it's not like it's not something new it's been there for the last couple of years when the digital wave uh, digitalization wave you know uh, sort of picked up steam but uh, for that i will quickly ask uh, nidhi again to run our last poll of the day uh, nidhi can you just run that and then we can have some context for the question to sindhu okay this is not company specific is it are you happy with the it industries reskilling drive hmm i think this is the first question where the top answer is not getting the max votes only a few companies are doing it well and i'm sure the companies here on the panel are part of that because we get only the best here right so and actually quite a few people believe about 40 of them so far that nobody is doing anything that is a little difficult to believe even though i you know we put the option there ourselves but uh, okay we have a fairly good vote 73% people have voted only a few companies are doing it well seems to be the dominant theme sindhu in this in terms of uh, the reskilling and the upskilling in terms of digital technologies and i believe uh, that is not far off from the ground situation and it is probably not far off from the ground situation in the west also right where to be a digital company is something that you know i read a mckinsey report a few weeks ago which said that only 4% of american companies can be called digital company in terms of the full optimal usage of digital technologies mm-hmm. so uh, you know the question to you is uh, while the it industry serves uh, so many different verticals like retail travel hospitality dfsi and all that you know what is it doing about themselves do you see the companies in india as somebody who you know engages with it companies here in india very deeply do you see them looking inwards towards their own digital transformation efforts and like you know the poll said only a few companies are doing it well what do you have to say to that yeah i think um, for any any organization to to kind of sustain innovation um, and i think everybody kind of alluded to that earlier on as well alokesh that uh we have to have a culture of continuous learning and talent development right uh, uh i i think i to my to your to your earlier question or suchetna's earlier question i talked about how um a, as an organization we transformed our entire hiring and recruitment into a uh, leveraging technology to turn that completely into a virtual um um and a uh, mode right and again this is just this is not just about conducting an interview virtually and things like that but we're talking about hardcore usage of technology into some of the core products that we use in that process and these are some of the products that we take to market in the space of say total workforce management um where we are looking into how how are uh, organizations managing their entire workforce beat uh, workforce within their organization or even beyond right so um uh, solutions like success factors i'm sure some of you have heard about it which is a leading uh, cloud solution in that space when we talk about talent management here we're talking about how are we leveraging technology like infusing ai ml 
to help in that whole recruitment process, to make sure that we avoid any biases that can be part of that process, to ensure that we can go through an automated uh, onboarding and, and also giving that infused intelligence, infused analytics as part of that process to give a, a recruitment or a talent attraction lead that visibility on where they are, where they are with budgets, where they are with kind of the skills that they're looking for and uh, how quickly that they need to kind of fill those gaps, right? So we're talking about deeply infusing technology into, core, into the core of our, our processes that we use uh, internally, but also in, in, um, uh, helping our customers also uh, leverage those kind of technologies. And coming to my point on the importance of continuous learning and also talent development, right? I think this becomes super important, especially if you're an organization who's focused on innovation and who's also looking into bringing together a diverse set of workforce across all ranges of experience into your organization that becomes a super important, right? And having those avenues that allow for that continuous learning to not just keep employees motivated, but also to build your talent pipeline to address that very complex business needs of your industry becomes super relevant, mm -hmm. right? And again, uh, you can just look at it, uh, the uptake of the various virtual learning platforms uh, that we see across, right? That's a testimony to that fact as well. And at SAP, if I just reflect on how we do it, I mean, continuous learning is, is part of our innovation DNA. And uh, this is also why we also uh, invest into uh, um, things like Open SAP, which is an open platform where several millions of users can come and learn and so on. But we also focus on kind of building those right set of skills like um, um, uh, I mean, when you have those conversations with customers, sometimes we are looking into conversations where the entire customer experience need to be kind of reimagined, right? And that's not just about, hey, here is my, my master of this technology, but to be able to envision where the customer is in that, that journey and kind of mm -hmm. co-innovate, co-work, co-design, get into a, a call and be able to get to that target outcome that we talked about. And, and this is also why programs like uh, DevX, where we bring our customers, bring our developers together to look at those kind of development journeys. Uh, also things like design thinking methodologies, which is kind of a part of our core DNA becomes a very, very key, right? Just recently, if I just reflect um, our entire innovation program that we do with the uh, uh, entrepreneurs within the company. So we have this program called Invent, and this is uh, for our India location. And we went completely virtual because earlier Invent was a kind of an on-site event where we went through a process of identifying people who had those ideas, bring them together, took them through a startup curriculum and um, uh, exposed yes. them to various things like business models and um, all yes. that. Now we opened it up to the 13,000 em employees across mm -hmm. India because we have the possibility to do that. And actually, as we speak, this is happening where that whole startup learning and unlearning, if you want to call it, is also happening, right? Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. So, so, yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, Sumit, before you uh, make your point, I'll just quickly go to Dibashish for one thing. This is where I stubbornly go back to uh, the issue that I raised, which is about uh, new frontiers of growth. So uh, for uh, Mindtree, what is your growth strategy in a post-COVID world? You have 92% of your revenues from Americas and, and Europe, and you've pointed out, pointed to an increasing demand in communication, media, and tech. So what is your growth strategy, Dibashish? No, I think, uh, you know, I'm not so fortunate as Tiger, and uh, I... <laughs> up this role in uh, last year and uh, I have a 17 percent of my revenues come from travel transportation hospitality so uh, again you can't be you know you, you never predicted something like COVID so obviously there are things that we are uh, thinking through I unfortunately cannot say much and my results are coming out next week and we are in a silent period but I can only say that uh, I, I think the view that we have is that digital has become completely mainstream so rather than saying digital transformation, we kind of use a different tagline. We say that we are helping our clients to, uh, you know, transform leveraging digital, you know, and, uh, uh, and in that process, uh, we are also reorganizing ourselves to a certain extent, and we are focusing significantly on um, customer success, customer experience. We are focusing significantly on cloud and data and also the enterprise IT, because our view is that as you are going after your customer base and you're talking about digital, digital is just not the front end, it's basically end to end. You have to kind of go from right from the 
uh, customer experience all the way to the enterprise IT, modernize the IT, etc. So that's the strategy that we have adopted, which is uh, something which we are going to share more as we go along. But overall, uh, you know, if your question is that, uh, you know, are we going to open up new industries and all? Nothing like that on the cards. But uh, we are we are kind of uh, hit fairly badly because of the choice of industries that we have been in. But honestly speaking, that's the way life is. But we are also very bullish in terms of some of the like uh, the CMT, the comms media technology. They have been kind of doing fairly well within this uh, through this downturn. So we are expecting that some of those things will you know turn over over a period of time. So all eyes on 14 July. That's when your Q1 results come out. Uh, I'll uh, go back to Sumit. Sumit, you wanted to make a point. Yeah, thank you, Sujitna. So I, yeah. I wanted to make a small point on reskilling. Yes. And I actually completely agree with the audience poll, right? That you know, the reskilling or, or continuous skilling, as Sindhu put it, uh, is a perfect amalgamation of people, process, and technology. One thing cannot solve it. And very often, you know, I find not probably with, with the companies that are sitting on the panel, but the leadership team of IT services and ITAS service companies always feel that we are doing a great job on reskilling. But the reality is that they aren't. Uh, and and you get the kind of response that you got from the audience because you know as you if you look at the real metrics or outcome metrics of reskilling, uh, we in the industry have had a very bad record of that. So uh, you know from my perspective, and I think it is it is we do a good job of cadre based training, but we do a very very lousy job of demand based skilling, uh, and we feel good about you know having you know, opened up digital training media to our employees. Uh, but I think it's time for the industry to start measuring outcomes, uh, you know, from the reskilling exercise rather than inputs, uh, you know, that we, that we all talk about and love to talk about. Sumit, can I add something? Uh, uh, because it's a very important point you're bringing up. Um, you know, I'd like to, um, uh, I'd like all of us to start thinking about it as, not as reskilling, but unskilling. Um, and I'll tell you why I feel that way. Uh, because this skills based perspective uh, is actually based on, um, you know, uh, based on saying that this is the boundaries around which my problem exists. And I'm going to do it within this boundary. So I'm a programmer, or I'm a business analyst, I'm a, or I'm a, uh, I'm a, uh, you know, applied mathematician or a statistician. You know, I think the boundaries of the problem space is constantly expanding. And therefore, you know, thinking about it, not from a skill based perspective, uh, tool set, skill set based perspective, but actually abstracting yourself to, uh, to becoming all rounders, you know, is becoming very, very important right now. And the reason I say that is if you just take the perspective that the world has become going from where we're in India, so we should talk about cricket. So if it's going from test cricket to one day cricket and 2020, you know, you will see that the number of all rounders keep increasing as you go from test cricket to one, one, one day cricket to 2020. You'll also see that the invention of the wicketkeeper batsman happening. You will also see that, uh, that there will be more time spent on nets and relative to the time in the game because you're practicing in, you know, your fitness becomes that much more important and things that were considered blasphemy in test in test cricket are com completely okay a reverse hit uh, you know uh, dill scoop all of those is completely okay so i think the perspective of i mean that comes from that why not perspective so what i would say is if we can get more and more people to learn within the canvas of their work rather than saying that i'll give separate time for you to unskill yourself but you know in the canvas of the work you have to you have to un uh, you know, unskill yourself and move into this world of saying that I can learn anything. You know, there is no boundaries for my learning. Uh, that becomes very, very important, uh, uh, Sumit. Right. So, Dheeraj, you know, basically, uh, it's a very good idea. You know, instead of having courses and all, learn on the job, right? I mean, give the guy a job where he has to learn a new skill. Is that what you're saying? Well, can we teach them? Boss, the rest are jute. Ah, that's the best way to learn. You know, mere ko, mere ko, you know, jute pe jute bolte ja rahe hain. You know, kaam pe sab seek rahe hain. I think this is exactly where methodologies like design thinking come to play, right? Where you don't just come with, hey, I'm aware of this technology, but you come together, you understand what's the outcome you want to get to, and what kind of skills do you need to get there, right? 
yeah yeah i th- i see this perspective of entity based thinking is being challenged by interaction based thinking okay so uh, you know i actually joke about it uh, for tambrams they will find it interesting because this uh, you know the old world was more aingar you know industry 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 now it's become ayer more horizontal right so <laughs> <laughs> but you have quite a few people here who can relate to that oh yeah yes at least i know 3 4 people so i thought we'll bro wants to say something yeah sir great 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 you know, i'm still i am still a founder driven private company i can be a little bit more blasphemous of course we can <laughs> monish you're saying things but you're on mute i think but we can't hear you you're not on mute but we can't hear you still oh can you hear me now yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. we can yeah. no i was saying neeraj i think it, it, i agree with you completely 101% but i think the world is rarely black and white right so focus as you said very right is so critical you need kind of get focused killing is also like that right at the end of the day you have some people at the bottom of the pyramid that you really have to make sure are very very skilled in a no, no i i completely agree with tiger on focus okay i believe that it's a big deal it's a big big deal focus is a huge deal but i think the the, the focus right now is not on industry but on industriousness right so you know that's that's where it becomes interesting because cpg wants to talk to retail and pharma wants to talk to pharmacy and pharmacy and pharma want to talk to payers uh, you know i think wo convergence hota rehta ho raha hai right hum usko rok nahi sakte we can't stop it right yeah. and, and that's because that's the nature of information information is information so it is always a work in progress it is in formation and therefore it constantly connects and therefore you have no choice um, but to accept that transience dheeraj you have just jumped to the top of the list of people i want to meet after the crisis gets over <laughs> <laughs> i want to sit with you and talk about science okay and things like that i but only I'll... physics <laughs> absolutely but uh, you know we have completely run out of time but i have one last question for tiger and which is a very small question and you know uh, i know he will answer it uh, you know in a tigerish way and is, which is that you just said that you had acquired a company you know uh, for customer experience right a company that specializes in experience so do you think that the pandemic has opened up greater opportunities for more uh, such value buyouts buyouts at a lower price So any dislocation in any market opens up opportunities for all kinds of things it opens up opportunities where that dislocation creates opportunities where you think a particular capability a particular skill is going to be more valuable faster than before so that's one thing that dislocation does and the other thing that dislocation does and the pandemic is going to do it is in every industry in every uh, arena uh, the distinction between winners and losers is going to get more dispersed uh, rather than right. when the rising tide is there everyone lifts up everyone rises yeah when the tide falls some fall faster than the others <laughs> so that creates an opportunity for um both you know i need something and there are going to be some people who are going to be more available not just because they are more distressed and value etc but also because they think they're actually combining with someone a uh, combining forces is going to create more value for themselves and for the employees and for the customer so the simple answer is i think there are lots of opportunities uh, to add through acquisitions however look the world is uncertain um valuation is uncertain equity markets are uncertain i think people can put whatever value they want uh, they won't be able to defend anything so it's a question of at what stage do you think there is reasonable visibility that the world has that you can pin on and uh, therefore say this is the right time to acquire uh, but i think it's 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 clearly an opportunity that lots of companies and lots of industries are going to look at and our industry is also going to look at and we will also continue to look at absolutely we've uh, completely run out of time an acquisition uh, doing an acquisition without meeting people uh, who are going to become part of the company is an interesting challenge i don't think it's impossible Because mm-hmm. after all, we've signed pretty significant deals uh, with brand new uh, enterprises in the last hundred days, and neither the client—I mean, obviously, none of our people have met none of our clients' people other than virtually. Um, mm-hmm. 
So instead of doing 10 meetings face to face that typically would have happened over a six month period, we've done 150 meetings virtually. And I would argue 150 meetings virtually uh, is more than equal to 10 face to face meetings. I still argue that. So, so I think we know okay. those people. They it's, know about, us it's about the journalists. About we about always swear by the face to face meetings though. <laughs> Zoom box. And, <laughs> Zoom box. <laughs> and the airline com companies are lamenting that all these uh, meetings happened virtually and did not happen face to face. Well, we've completely run out of time. Thank you to each one of you for uh, joining us on this very esteemed panel. It was an absolute privilege for me uh, to have uh, been the moderator here. We, uh, after a very long time, we've been doing webinars and after a very long time, we've looked beyond the lamentations that COVID has brought about. And we looked at the opportunities. And as uh, Devashish pointed out, we looked at the responsibilities that uh, this uh, pandemic has entailed us with. As uh, Tiger pointed out that, you know, we should not be looking at um, the work from home from a money saving perspective, but a perspective of investment, investment that can help future innovation. As Sindhu very rightly put it, this is the right time to ensure that the culture is also virtually transmitted to new uh, people who are onboarded. And also how uh, Sindhu pointed out that uh, skilling is uh, the need and we should not lose sight of it. Uh, thank you very much for all your insights, Dheeraj. I have read in a book that you are a believer in Shiva. So therefore, I think you believe that the destruction is over and that will lead to more, uh, perhaps newer vistas and more opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, I, think, I, I think the way I think about it is Shiva is nothing but entropy. And he's always dancing with Shakti, who is energy. Uh, Shiva yes. is formless, therefore entropy. And Shakti is the form. Uh, so that perspective of, uh, you know, old science, which we mistakenly call Hinduism, uh, you know, is lost. Uh, the first law of thermodynamics is that Shakti is always conserved. And the second law of thermodynamics is that Shiva is always expanding. So, uh, so with that perspective, you know, you can, you can keep a perspective. What I am a believer in is not Shiva. It's actually entropy. Great. Thanks for that line to sum up uh, this great uh, discussion. Sumit, you actually set the tone for today's panel discussion with uh, your uh, insights with that presentation. Thank you, Munish, for your perspective. Uh, and uh, so again, thanks all of you. Alokesh, uh, over to Thank you. Thank you all very much. You know, I can't say anything beyond what Suchetna has already said. These are the great insights. It was a really great panel to have. Uh, thank you to our partner, SAP, you know, for giving us this opportunity. Uh, to do these uh, panel CEO dialogues and we love doing them and we hope to see you again soon in another dialogue that uh, we'll probably line up. Thank you all thank very you. much. Tiger, special thanks for getting up at, you know, God knows you go woke up at probably 5 a.m. to join this my call. Normal, it's my normal time. Okay, your normal time. Then you remember, I'm a, I'm a tam -ram. <laughs> You forgot who's a tam -ram. Yes. <laughs> and your relatives. And see, we gave Dheeraj, you the so. opportunity, and we gave Dheeraj the opportunity of connecting with uh, his relatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Okay, all right. Thank you all very, very much. Thanks to all the people Thank who so attended much. today. Thanks all of you.